Now you may <clears throat> only see a pile of boring forms and numbers, but I see a story. Today, we are looking at all the details that went into making everything, everywhere, all at once. With very few resources, they managed to craft a masterpiece. Ready to find out who was in all the gorilla suits? Hello! Number one. With their micro budget of $25 million, they were working with the 99 cent store equipment. The entire project was filmed in just 37 or 38 days. Director Daniel Kwan, one half of the duo that makes up the Daniels, got a pocket camera that shoots 4K, and everywhere he went, he would just shoot the streets. He shot a bunch of stock footage, cut it together, and then acted it out to Michelle Yeoh. Then, Michelle had to do it in slow motion, set up in front of a green screen. They had LED panels on either side of Yo, showing what was happening on screen. They added a few special effects in post, like slow motion streaks and shattering glass, but ultimately didn't want to pull attention away from Yo. Number two, sometimes when you know what you want, you just gotta do it yourself. We ended up having almost 500 visual effects shot. For the most part, all done by only five people. Which is kind of unheard of. Movies of this scale usually have a whole army of artists working on the special effects, but once again, when you're working with a small budget, you've got to do a lot of the heavy lifting yourself. But with a movie as crazy as the one that's quite literally about everything, everywhere, it makes it all the more impressive. The VFX work they did varied a lot, from simple wire removal to some visual effects that were blended into the live action, and then a few sequences that were full-blown VFX. Number three, on a movie with a budget of this size, if they didn't use practical effects, it just wouldn't have gotten made. The first time Yo does a jump and connects to herself in another universe was just one of their practically done effects. She shoots back in her office chair and flies through a door. The fun thing about that shot is it's 100% practical in camera. We didn't change anything. It was done in camera by cranking open the shutter to get the really nice streaks. We had hidden a leaf blower behind her. And Yo was pushed in a wheelbarrow really slowly through the office and had to freak out in slow motion. What's happening? Number four. This movie took hand puppets too literally. The raccoon and the hot dog hands were not done with CGI at all, but rather puppets. The team enjoyed using practical elements because they didn't require the actors to act opposite a tennis ball or pretend they had weird fingers and hoped it worked out once the CGI was added. Number five. If you hadn't seen this movie and listened to this next part, you would be left with more questions than answers. When Yo first learned about the hot dog fingers, she tried to have the scene cut because it was just too absurd. But when she learned about the she was like, are you kidding me? Michelle was thinking, I am a serious actor. I have done amazing movies and I'm rolling around on the ground with a block. So I must thank my directors for the most amazing first time experience. Stunt choreographer Andy admitted, let's just say the situation of the block fight scene was so weird and out of this world that me, Brian and Michelle couldn't focus on shooting without laughing in between takes. Number six, successfully pulling off this scene must have felt like acing a test you didn't study for. For Quan, the fanny pack fight was tough. Not only had he not yet landed the neck wrap with a kick back towards the camera, but they only had limited shots to nail it, given their tight budget. The pressure was on. Quan said, take two came and I'm thinking, please, God, let me do this right. And I did it on the second take. He did every move in that complicated fight scene, except one where he was happy to let a stunt double step in. Number seven, you'd be wigging out too if you had to make this many wigs. The film was meant to be a love letter to Michelle Yeoh's career. And so, Anissa Salazar pulled some of her inspiration from Yeoh's own filmography. Yo's looks were made from a mixture of wigs and hair pieces. One of the most important things to Salazar was that she wanted to make sure the wigs were consistent throughout. So even though Michelle had over 40 plus hair changes, she still had that individuality with all the rest of the characters. The toughest part wasn't crafting the looks, but rather pulling them together on a tight schedule, which could include up to 10 changes a day. The hairstylist in the Hot Dogs for Hands universe was chosen by Curtis from a stock photo of a stressed out IRS tax agent. Salazar recreated the hairstyle for Curtis, which she said would sometimes look like Lord Farquaad from Shrek. 
the bagel hairdo was designed to look not just like a bagel, but specifically like an everything bagel. Salazar wanted her to have this ethereal, kind of celestial goddess vibe, and she wanted to create something complex, saying, the pattern I came up with represents the depth of this character's interior, where it felt futuristic, yet unique, yet a little chaotic. To create the look, she added different layers of beads, there were foam cutouts, wire was used, and she used multiple varieties of braids, from fishtail braids to bamboo braids to normal braids. And then they added a 22-inch extension ponytail for that dramatic length. Number 8. Going prosthetic-less is like going commando in the Hollywood universe. Jamie Lee Curtis was keeping it real and refusing to wear any prosthetics for her role as the weird IRS inspector. Kwan said, Everyone assumes that her belly in the movie is a prosthetic, but it's actually her real belly. She was grateful that she was allowed to just let it out. Immediately after signing up, she started sending the Daniels weird photos and hairdo ideas. Dan was the one who found a photo online of a real IRS auditor, and Jamie fell in love, saying, That's incredible. Please let me be her. Please, 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 please. So that photo became the reference. Curtis just wanted to be truthful to this woman, because, as she said, in the world, there is an industry. A billion dollar, trillion dollar industry about hiding things. Everything to conceal the reality of who we are. And her instruction to everybody was, I want there to be no concealing of anything. Number 9. The range of costumes in this movie is quite unfathomable. Some costumes were pieced together from shopping in Los Angeles Chinatown. Some came from Amazon. That is where they got multiples of that awesome pleather fanny pack. Kurata said, as a costume designer, I think about where would she shop and where would she get her clothes? Well, she would go to Chinatown. She admitted, I was really scared because Michelle, having come from crazy rich Asians, what if she's gonna expect all these expensive designer clothes and I'm getting these really inexpensive clothes from Chinatown? Is she gonna be upset? But it was the easiest fitting and I was so grateful she was open to not the most glamorous outfit. When you're working with multiple universes, color palettes become super important to keep one world straight from the next. So the inspiration for the outfits in the Hot Dog Fingers universe was actually hot dogs themselves. Beige and light pink colors were used, inspired by buns and wieners. Horowski's films were another big inspiration. Number 10. There wasn't enough space in a movie about everything for this scene. Sorry. In a very early draft of the movie, it opened with a narration about everything hanging in the balance, relying on the present moment. There's a man whose job it is to test football helmets. There's a quantum accident, and he passes through a wall. Convinced it's a miracle, he keeps trying to perform miracles until he's injured by some robbers. In some universes, he lives, and in others, he does not. Then it switches to a football player mid-game who, if he catches the ball, becomes a cult leader. And if he doesn't, he becomes a sad carpenter. And he only finds happiness in universes where tables can talk. It was a great opening, but it did not focus enough on the main character to make it past the first draft. Number 11. We wonder if they'd realized what they cut before it hit theaters, if they'd put it back in. There was a second scene that was cut where Jenny Slate's character comes in with a weapon and she and Evelyn struggle over it. Evelyn turns the weapon into a phone and brings up Jenny's character's family on FaceTime, where her son begs her to come to his birthday party. It wound up being incredibly problematic when it was cut because it left no rectification for Evelyn calling Jenny's character a crude term, to put it lightly. Number 12. We aren't talking about fighting off the vid, just beating that March shutdown in 2020. Everything Everywhere All at Once got incredibly lucky because they finished their principal filming when the rumors of COVID were still just spreading. On the last day of shooting, the crew pulled an all-nighter, getting the sense that things were getting really bad. They finished their principal photography the Saturday morning before COVID hit. They only had to push a few pickups and green screen shots. Number 13. The beginning came from a surprisingly simple place. Dan Kwan said, I was driving with my fiance to Big Sur because we were checking out wedding venues. That long ride going back and forth up a mountain lulled me into a state of thinking about high concept sci-fi ideas. Number 14. Now it's time to reveal who was under those gorilla masks. It's Daniel Scheinert in the hot dog ape costume, striking the finishing blow to a non-hot dog fingered ape. The production only had two ape suits, so he isn't just the lead ape in the sequence, he plays almost all of them. And that was Daniel Kwan leading that ceiling smashing dance in the video. 
Number 15. Who's a villain? Who's a baby? Who knows? The name of the film's villain, Jobu Topaki, came from a list of interesting sounds Daniel Kwan and his wife generated when they were looking for a name for their daughter. Do you think this is funny? If you haven't seen this movie yet, and for some reason listened all the way to the end of all this gibberish, do yourself a favor and check it out. If you could visit any alternate universe, which one would you pick? Let us know in the comments, and thanks for hanging out with us here at The Things.